your publication agreements can make a profound difference in the way you work with your materials and the way you manage your own copyrights. And really our subject today is your scholarship and your copyrights and how you can best manage your works. So let me introduce myself. Again, my name is Kenneth Cruz. I'm here at Columbia as the director of the Copyright Advisory Office, an office that works with faculty, librarians, and others throughout the university to help address copyright issues that affect our work. And what we really want to be able to do today is to talk about how we can be proactive, how we can really take action with respect to our works. And, and what we want to do in a brief outline is make sure that everybody knows your rights and I'm focused specifically when I talk today on authors. Authors who are writing particularly journal articles, but it could be books, it could be videos, it could be any other new work that you're creating. And uh, talking to authors about the importance of knowing your rights, knowing what you want from your rights and from your work, and as you work with publishers to be able to ask questions, to negotiate, and you know, I hope I say it three times because it's really the most important thing you could come away with. Whatever kind of agreement you sign with your publisher, be sure to keep a copy. And I'm going to say it again, keep a copy. You need to keep a copy because frequently, in fact just yesterday I had a question come in about, about an author and an author's rights and a journal and who gets to do what. And the answer to the question begins, what does the contract say? So you're advised to have a good contract that answers questions, that gives you rights, and keep a copy. Because by keeping a copy, we can then reference that in the future and we know the answer to our questions. The subject is your publication agreement and we, the agreements are really founded on a solid set of points about copyright. So we need to know a few things about copyright law in order to get started. The first basic principle of copyright is that copyright vests instantly and automatically for almost all of our new creative works. As soon as we write an original work of authorship, take a picture, write a paragraph, write the, the software code, whatever we do, and as soon as we fix it in some tangible medium, we've stored it in the computer, we've written it on paper, it's captured in the camera, whatever it means, it now has instant automatic copyright protection. And that protection lasts for a long time. Basically, for works created today, most of the copyrights are going to last for the lifetime of the author, however long you might live, plus 70 more years. Seven zero. That's a long time. That's a long time. And so, putting those principles in context, with your publications. One thing we can certainly say is that your works are almost absolutely positively protected by copyright. The words are, the charts are, the pictures are, the graphs are, whatever might be a creative work, and the level of creativity, by the way, is very modest. So whatever is an original work that you contribute to that finished scholarly contribution, you're going to have copyright protection. And under the law, you're the author. And if you co-authored with somebody, you have joint copyright ownership. And just to make clear, under Columbia University policy, as well as policies under most, most uh, uh, universities, at most universities around the country, the copyright in our scholarly works and our teaching materials and such kinds of works are typically left to the author. So if you're the author of that journal article, just to focus on those types of works, if you're the author of that journal article, odds are that you are the one who's going to be able to make the decisions about the copyright and managing that copyright. So really, the last line up here is one that I want to use to kind of, kind of poke you a little bit. What's your copyright policy? What's your standard for what you need to hold, what you're willing to give away, what you insist on retaining, and what kind of agreement you're willing to sign? Because that agreement, as we now will find out, goes directly to the rights of use of the work. 
and that agreement addresses how the work can be used, who has what control, and who can benefit from that particular work. Now, at this point, I think it's really safe to ask why you should care or what could possibly go wrong, and the answer is a whole lot could go wrong because the holder of the rights is the one who determines who has access to that work, who can find it, who can read it, who can use it. And if the holder of the rights is you, then you get to make those decisions. And if you're part of the academy, you're probably going to be fairly generous with your colleagues around the country and around the world. But if you transfer those rights out to somebody else, then that other party has all control. And that level of control or standard of control may not match your priorities. And that's the problem. And we've had many instances of this. You want to even use your own work in connection with teaching and research. You need to request permission and pay a fee. You want to be able to reuse your work in a future publication. You need to go back to the publisher and seek permission to be able to do it unless you retain those rights up front. And even worse, there are some unwanted uses um, that may be undertaken by the party who holds, holds the rights. And we've had those situations as well, where author writes the article, transfers the copyright to the publisher, then years later the publisher reuses that article in another publication. It's out of date, it may not be what you want to stand by today, it may not even have your name on it. And all of these are your concerns, but you've transferred the rights to somebody else and you no longer control them. In this mix of copyright and publication agreements, there are a few things, practical considerations, that we really want to focus on in our talk today really focusing on how your publication agreement can serve some of these goals. The increased worldwide exposure of your work through the repository here at Columbia, its academic commons. How you can have rights to share your work with colleagues, to use it with, and distribute it out to your students in connection with your teaching, to post it to your website, to make future revisions of your own work, and how ultimately you can be sure that you have credit and control and can share your work in a way that best serves your objectives as the scholar. And so why now, you might be asking? And there are really many reasons. Each of these could be a talk in and of itself. Technology has changed. We have new opportunities for the way we create and use scholarly works. We have a growth of open access opportunities, new journals and new repositories to make our, the works that we create widely available. We also have new attention to open access through faculty resolutions at Harvard, MIT, and a host of other universities around the country and around the world where the universities are saying, or the faculty authors are really saying, we as, as authors of new works are hereby committed to making our work available through the university repository. That opens up access and doesn't limit access to just the formal publisher's database, which has a number of restrictions associated with it. If we take a look at the publication agreements themselves, and we're about to go into taking a look at some specific provisions, we can start with some general concepts about how really different the view of publication agreements is from the perspective of the publisher and from the perspective of the author. Even without looking at the issues in detail, we can see immediately that very often publishers and authors have diverging goals and objectives. This means, really honestly, that the publication agreement and the new issues that you might bring to the negotiation of your agreement are not necessarily incompatible with the goals of the publisher, but yet there are a different set of issues that are really up to you to raise in the process. And so, in that context, I want to focus on a handful of issues. These are some of the issues that I usually look at in connection with publication agreements, but 
Today we're going to focus on really a few. We're going to look on, at the question of whether there's an assignment of the copyright or whether it's a license of the copyright. We're going to look at the set of rights that might be reserved back to the author. And we're going to look at what are the terms perhaps of some of the versions of the work that you as the author may be able to use. And so that would also lead to the question of which work or which version of the work may be made available through the repository or some other means. So getting down to some practical nitty-gritty, you're the author of that journal article and again it could be any other kind of work but sticking with the most familiar, you're the author of that, of that work. What I want you to do is follow these simple steps to get started. First, read carefully. And that's why the reference to Mad Men up there, you know, where he just says, I sign things, I don't read agreements. That can't be you, because this is your livelihood at stake. You need to read carefully, you need to assess your alternatives and ask critical questions about your agreement. You can take the opportunity to go online at a couple of websites that can help you very much even with your initial choice of publisher. Take a look at the Sherpa Romeo site where you can review the contract terms of m many of the leading scholarly journals around the world. You can look at the, the directory of open access journals where you can see which journals are already committed to making their content openly available for all to find. But once you've done that, you've now written your article, you've submitted it for publication, you've been accepted for publication, and now you're excited. Now you've got this contract that they're asking you to sign. This is where I need you to read carefully. This is for your own benefit. And let's now get into the nitty gritty of some language. You know, one important approach that's caught on in recent years is the idea of attaching an addendum to the agreement. And SPARC, an associ national association that's encouraging uh, a lot of these, these activities, has been promoting a, an addendum that specifically holds back a certain bundle of rights of uses to the author. And in particular, it's the right to use the article in connection with the author's own conference presentations, teaching, etc. The right to be able to take that article and post it to the website for that where the author, you as the author, may accumulate your work and share them with others. And it acknowledges that policy, like the Harvard Resolution, that pre-contractual commitment that you will deposit that work with your university repository. This is an incredibly important, simple first step. To be able to say, no matter what's in that publication agreement, I want to assure myself that I have these certain rights of use. And, and look at how simple they are. The ability to put the work on, on the website where you gather your, your materials, the ability to share that work with your colleagues and with your students, those are fundamental objectives for our scholarship. And yet, very often, they're not covered in the publication agreement. It's up to you. Let me look through what's basically almost a random set of journal uh, publication agreements and a couple of book publication agreements that I had available to me and that show different ways that publishers address these issues. IEEE, leading publisher in the area of electronics and electrical engineering, and look at this language, and this is part of what I want you to watch for. The author hereby assigns all rights to IEEE, assigns all rights under copyright. I want you to watch out for that language because that means that all the copyright is moving from you to the publisher. Now we got to keep reading because it says I hereby give all rights. However, there's more. There are certain rights that are retained in that same agreement back to the author. And th these rights include the right to make reproductions of the work for the author's personal use and to make limited distribution of the work. If you, as the author, 
inform IEEE in, in advance. So, you know, it's really not much of a right to use because you have to remember to go and inform them. And for all other uses, the author must request permission from the IEEE Intellectual Property Rights Office. This looks good when you see it in the contract, but frankly, this is not much of a bundle of rights given back to you. I, I, w I would generally say you want and probably need more than what's allowed here. Let's look at another one, another journal, the Annals of Neurology. In consideration of the journal reviewing and editing your submission, the author hereby transfers or otherwise conveys copyright ownership in all print and electronic formats over to the publisher. There's that language again. And frankly, taking a look at this agreement, it didn't even have a however. It's, it's a full transfer over to the publisher. Sometimes you're stuck. Sometimes that's what you need to do. But at the bare minimum, I want you to be aware that you're giving away all of your rights. And there's really not much, if anything, left over for you. Here's an example. Facet Publishing publishes books. And this is a contract related to a book. And the provision says that the copyright in the chapter will remain with you. That's a pretty cool thing. So now it's very clearly not a transfer of the copyright. However, the details count. You agree to assign to the publisher the exclusive right to publish and license for publish the chapter that goes into this book without any limitations, etc. So for starters, you retain the copyright, but by giving away the exclusive right, of publication, you know, once again, there's not a whole lot left for you. However, reading on, publisher grants back to you, you're the author, the right to share with colleagues in print or electronic form your own final version of the chapter. And it may be posted on the author's website for personal or professional use. I, I, let me, let me be, be very cautious and say about all of these agreements that you know I've got some language quoted, other language paraphrased. You always, always, always have to look at the details. But first, it's, an, it's not a transfer of copyright under this agreement. But it is a grant of an exclusive license of publication. That's pretty sweeping, actually. But then it is a grant back of some pretty good rights to you as the author. The right to share with your colleagues in print or electronic form, and even post it to your own website for personal or professional use. That's pretty cool, because at least once you can get it on the website, you'd like to have more, but at least if you can get it on the website, then all of those other users who might want to find it, you can refer them to the website. Notice very carefully the version that you may share is your own final version of the chapter. I suspect what the publisher means by that is it's the version, like a TypeScript version, as you called final and you submitted for publication. It doesn't include then any subsequent edits. It doesn't include the page layout. It doesn't include any of that. I suspect that that's what the publisher means. And you, again, might want to raise that question and clarify it with the publisher. A very important publisher of our scholarly work, Nature Publishing Group, publishes a long series of, of important journals. And here's their standard language. Author grants to the publisher the exclusive license. Now, let me pause and clarify. A transfer of the copyright involves all of the rights of the copyright owner, leaves you with, for all practical purposes, nothing. On the other hand, if it's a license, then it's a permission. And there are two bits of caution, two dimensions of caution about a license. First, what exactly is it a license to do? License to publish? What does that mean? Does that mean all forms of reproduction and distribution? That exactly what the license covers is an important point. And second, the, the, other, the other dimension of it is exclusive versus non-exclusive. This language is, let's see if I've got the right one up there, an exclusive license to publish. That means 
nobody else may do this act of publish, whatever that might mean. However, always keep reading, under the nature agreement, author retains rights to a few things. To reproduce the article in a book of which he or she is the author, so not somebody else's book, not a collection book, but rather if you're writing a book next year and this article from last year is going to become chapter two, that looks okay. To reproduce the work for your teaching, to post the author's version on a website or an institutional repository after a six month embargo or delay and to reuse figures and tables that were created by the author. So you could write a new paper and include those same figures and tables over in that one. This is not a bad starter list, not bad at all. There may be other things that are important to you, but the Nature Publishing Agreement says we're not going to necessarily take the copyright, but we are going to take sweeping rights, the exclusive right to publish, reproduce, display, etc. But then we will grant back to you a bundle of reasonably practical rights. Here's another example, and it's a good point of caution. Um, the publisher Taylor and Francis publishes many, many, many journals. And, and not all agreements from a single publisher are the same. And this is a good case study of that. Uh, many Taylor and Francis uh, agreements do call for a transfer of the copyright. I happened to pick up this one and it called for a non-exclusive license to publish the manuscript uh, in, in throughout the world. That's a non-exclusive license. That's pretty cool. That means that you as the author can retain rights to do some of the very same things that the journal is doing. Its rights are not exclusive. And here's one to watch out for, especially in the realm of book publishers that are putting together collections. Watch for this language. The contribution that you're making to this book is under this agreement deemed to be a work made for hire. Watch for that language because that is even more sweeping. It's a long technical discussion, but it's even a more sweeping possession of the rights, the legal rights, more sweeping than a transfer of the copyright. So watch out for that work made for hire. When you see that, you definitely need to carve out rights back to you. And notice this agreement, though, goes even further. Not only is it calling your contribution a work made for hire, but it goes even further and says that you as the author will not, without the publisher's prior written consent, publish a similar work that is intended for inclusion in a competitive book or other resource. So that topic on which you wrote may be your career specialty. And now you've signed an agreement that says you can't even write a similar work. Never mind use the same work. So what are the mechanics? When you pick up that agreement, you see any of this language. In addition to reading carefully, asking tough questions, and absolutely, did I say keep a copy? Keep a copy. Whether you've got a good agreement, a bad agreement, even if you don't read it, keep a copy. But what can you do to change that agreement? You absolutely should not be hesitant to raise questions, to raise questions with the editor, raise questions with the publisher, and to begin negotiating. Ask. The, the worst that we've seen happen is the publisher says, no, we don't do that. But we've never seen a situation where your publication is somehow put at risk. And you can change the agreement by rewriting the terms, by putting notes in the margin and scratching out other terms, or by attaching the addendum, like what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation today. But most of all, change your outlook. Change your habits, change the way you look at these agreements, change your willingness, be engaged with the process, because the holder of the rights is the one who controls your scholarship. Be sure you hold rights to your own works. And then we have a variety of materials up on the copyright website. Take a look at those for more information and guidance about publication agreements and about open access. 
and I thank you very much.